A while ago, the Wayfinder's Guide to Eberron was released onto the DMs Guild, giving us Eberron for 5th edition, and that book offers up Sharn, the City of Spires, as a location you can set your campaign in. Now, Sharn is a great place to start out in, but I would like to offer up an alternative for you here today by presenting Greywall, the gateway to Drome, the nation of monsters. Drome is, in my opinion, one of the most interesting places in Eberron, an entire nation of monsters working together to forge something new out of a harsh wilderness. But it is a place that can be difficult to experience for your average group of adventurers. And that's where Greywall comes in. Greywall is a city located close to the borders of Breeland and acts as a gateway to Drome. It has a large foreigner quarter where adventurers can get the comforts and safeties of home, while the rest of the city still offers up the exotic and alien aspects of Drome. The city of Greywall was once a fortress belonging to the Dakani Empire, the goblin nation that at one point spread across all of Corvair. It was meant to protect the nation from monsters who even back in those days haunted the wilds of Drome, but fell to the Dalkir in the Great War against them. In the thousands of years since then, many monsters have occupied the ruins, but it's not until now that anyone has ever tried to rebuild. Even so, there are many tunnels and caves underneath Greywall that tie into the larger Kyber, and much of those are filled with creatures that even most monsters of Drome find terrifying and dangerous. Greywall is a city of about 6,000. Most of the inhabitants are goblins, orcs, shifters, and ogres, while minotaurs, harpies, medusa, trolls, and gargoyles serve specific roles within the city. But the city is home to all kinds of monsters and creatures you can imagine, and even sports a fairly large population of people from the Five Kingdoms, mostly adventurers, criminals, and exiles. The city is a center of industry and trade for Drome, and as such it's surrounded by mines and quarries, and the skies above Greywall are thick with the smoke from the foundries and workshops, but its primary function is to serve as a bulwark and a fortress towards the Five Kingdoms. In fact, during the Great War, the city served as one of Drome's primary staging grounds for mercenary forces, shipping out to fight for the Five Kingdoms. The city itself is divided into four districts, each with their own unique feel and look and feel. The district best known by outsiders, and the district most travelers will be spending most of their time in, is the Calabas, which is the goblin world word for kennel. The district is dominated by the dragon-marked houses and their businesses, and a great deal of effort has been made both by the houses and the drone government to ensure that outsiders feel welcome in the area. The buildings of the Calabas are constructed in the architectural styles of the Five Kingdoms, and many houses are decorated and painted in bright colors. Street signs and shops are clearly marked in common, which is unusual for a drone town, since most of the monsters of the city cannot read. Cannot read. Signs on buildings or streets in the rest of the town use crude pictograms or other simple images. Not entirely surprising, most of the human citizens of Greywall can be found in this district. It also has a very large population of orcs, in no small part because the district is effectively governed by House Farashk. House Farashk have long had a close relationship with Drome. The house hires out monsters as both mercenaries and laborers across Corvair. House, Farashk Encla house Farashk's enclave in Greywall is the second largest Farashk enclave in the world, and as such the house has a lot of influence in the city. The half-orc Baron Condren Thorn governs the enclave and has been permitted to uphold the law and order as he sees fit within the Calabas. Instead of city guards, Farashk orcs in the house's colors patrol the streets of the district, and anyone who breaks the law is charged and punished by the house. The Farashk Enclave acts as a regional center for prospecting and the training and deployment of monstrous mercenaries, but of course the Enclave also provides all the regular Farashk services, such as inquisitives, trackers, and guides. Usually only a force of about 20 orc guards guard the district and the Enclave, but they are enforced by any mercenaries currently being housed or trained in the Enclave, so at most times, House Farashk has a significant military presence in the city. House Farashk is far from the only house that is invested heavily in Greywall, however. House Orion also has a very large enclave in the city. The sisters of Sora Kel hope to one day expand the lightning rail system to Drome, and know that the key to trade with the rest of Corvair is good relationships with House Orion. As such, they've made some very favorable deals with the house and subsidized their business within Greywall. Most of the Orion enclave consists of huge caravan grounds. They, they stand empty for the most part, as the enclave is constructed for future and could handle several times the traffic it does these days. The Enclave also has a teleportation circle and offers teleportation services, although they are quite pricey. In fact, it's so rare that anyone uses the teleportation circle that news of someone doing so usually spreads like wildfire, wildfire throughout the district. It is clear that House Orion is in Greywall to stay. They've invested heavily in their facilities, and the Baron of the Enclave, Saria de Orion, has developed contacts and brokered deals throughout the city. 
House Galanda is probably the third largest dragon marked house in the city. They have a Gold Dragon Inn there, which if you do not know, the Gold Dragon Inns are effectively a chain of inns that are run by the house and exist all over Corvair. They offer dishes from each of the five nations, so regardless of where you're from, you can always feel at home at a Gold Dragon Inn. And they are reasonably priced at standard rates. I really wish there was a map of a Gold Dragon Inn somewhere, but I haven't found one. If anyone knows of one, then please let me know. In the meantime, I have a flip mat I've been intending to use for them, but my players usually avoid them. House Galanda also have the Twilight Palace, which they run with the help of House Fjarlan. The Twilight Palace is a heavily fortified luxury hotel, a place that offers safety, anonymity, and a way to escape from the harshness of Drome. All the clients of the palace are, are extremely wealthy. Some of them are nobles or merchants who are visiting the town, others are powerful individuals in exile from the Five Kingdoms. As long as you can pay, House Galanda will keep you safe, and they use the latest magics of House Kundrak to do so. Trying to exfiltrate someone from the Twilight Palace would be hard indeed, and could turn out to be an interesting adventure. Speaking of House Kundarak, they also have a small outpost in Greywall that they share with House Sivis. It's a small stone building that offers access to the Kundarak banking services and the Sivis messenger services, including the Kundarak vault network and the Sivis speaking stone network. The last house to have a presence in Greywall is Jurasco. Halo de Jurasco operates a small clinic called Halo's House. It's small but functional. Halo himself has a dragon mark, so can offer up some magical assistance to those in need, but unless he likes you, he's going to hit you up with a 20% drone tax, as he calls it, making him a little pricey to visit. There are plenty of other places to visit in the Calabas district that isn't under the control of the dragon marked houses. If you're looking for a warm meal or a place to rest, you have several options. You could visit the Merry Marcher, who's, which specializes in food from the Shadow Marches. Or you could swing by the Cracked Keg, a somewhat shady tavern. The Cracked Keg is run by the greedy and selfish dwarf Banner Black Barrel. The Keg isn't a great place for a meal, but it does offer a wide selection of drone spirits and a fair bit of gambling. It also has a blood, den, uh, blood gin den in the basement, for those looking for something a bit extra. Blood gin is a fairly nasty drug. Essentially, it's a spirit made from a special kind of berry that has been soaked in the blood of murdered humanoids. Drinking the vile liquid gives you a heavy rush, filled with visions taken directly from the memories of the murdered person. During the high, you will likely live through the best parts of the person's life, but when you crash, you instead get to live the lows. Most of the time, you get to experience how the person was murdered. Blood gin is extremely addictive, and very, very illegal in the Five Kingdoms. Drome, however, does not answer Gelliferian law, and so we can get it in Greywall. If you're looking for something a little tamer, you can always get a meal and maybe a bed at the House of the Nine. A small inn and a tavern, with only four rooms to rent, the House of the Nine also doubles up as the only temple to the sovereign host in Greywall. The proprietors cannot cast spells, but do offer, a, do offer up spiritual guidance and mundane healing in addition to their roles as innkeepers. When it comes to entertainment, there is actually a fair bit on offer in the Calabas, outside of the Twilight Palace. If you're feeling lonely, you could swing by Veils. It's a brothel operated by a group of doppelgangers. They offer the rather exotic services of being able to transform themselves to better fit your preferences, adopting accents or races as needed. They also offer another expensive service, where they psychically probe the client and adopt the form of someone they know, such as a long-lost lover. This is not only used for sex, believe it or not, but some come here to relive moments with lost loved ones, such as dinner with a long-dead friend. The courtesans are very skilled at their mimicry, and rarely disappoint. There is also the Silent Stage, a rather exceptional theatre that specializes in performing plays that are forbidden or censored in the rest of Corvair. It's a great place to visit to take in a show, if you share their revolutionary bend. People from all over Corvair actually travel to Greywall just to take in a show at the Silent Stage. The theatre sports many famous and infamous actors and playwrights, and is run by Asta Brand, a woman who has been turned into a vampire by the Order of the Emerald Claw and fled to Rome. If you're looking to trade, the best place to go is the Roar. It is a large square at the heart of a district. Each night the Roar is transformed into the Goblin Market, where when all kinds of monsters come to sell their wares to travellers and tourists of Calabas. Although we can never be guaranteed to find what you're looking for, you can find almost anything at the Goblin Market sooner or later. In the adventure Secrets of the Ashen Crown, you get a poster map of the market, which is handy in case players get into a bit of trouble while shopping. There's also the Sil Haberdashery for Davandi. 
part of a larger chain of stores owned by the Devande family, who are one of the more powerful gnomish clans of Zil and are distant cousins to House Civis, Far Devande is perhaps best known for her hats but also produce clothing and replicate the fashions of the Five Kingdoms. They mostly target their, most remarkable their wares towards the exile community of Greywall, trying to cash in on that nostalgia and homesickness. The last place of interest in the district is Vorgaf's. Vorgaf was once a prospector, but has now turned his interest into trade, and is always looking for interesting things to buy. His shop is one of a few places in town where players can reliably get large sums of gold for their go goods and trinkets, as he keeps about 1500 on hand at all times. In general, you can pay with Galifar coins in most places in Greywall, but most monstrous merchants might not be able to pay you back in coin. Much trade is done in barter, and you can be offered the strangest things in exchange for what you're trying to sell. One of the most common barter currencies in, that they use in Greywall is Monster Teeth. The Sisters of Sora Kel offer bounties on some creatures that are a threat to trade or travel, and so teeth of those beasts are have a worth. It's a currency that can be tricky to understand as an outsider. The largest district of Greywall, and perhaps the one most think of when describing the city, is Sorgun, which is the goblin word for Bloodstone. Most of these city's medium and large creatures live throughout the district. Bloodstone gets its name from a strange red rock that most of the original Dakani fortress was built from. Legend states that when the fortress was destroyed by the Dalkir Lord during the war, the goblinoid garrison was absorbed into the rock, giving it its color. After 10,000 years, it's hard to know how much of that is true, however. Most of Greywall is built out of River Plain and practical grey granite, but many buildings throughout the district are built from red bloodstone harvested from the ruins. Throughout the district, it is common to see circles drawn or scratched into the ground. These are challenge rings, usually thrown together in haste by two monsters seeking to challenge each other. These serve as impromptu entertainment for the creatures of Greywall. Not only for the competing monsters, but also for the spectators to quickly form whenever a challenge goes down, as the citizens of Greywall are competitive and love to gamble. Challenges are most often between two creatures of the same type, and, a different, and different creatures prefer different kinds of sport. Minotaurs will try to force each other out of the ring using their horns. Ogres prefer to show each other off in feats of strength, such as lifting heavy boulders above their heads. Cobbles challenge each other to insult fights, and there is, of course, always the occasional straight-up brawl. The monsters of Greywall play tough, so it's not rare for a bit of blood to be spilled, or for someone to lose some teeth. But usually, the point is to win, not to maim or kill. Considering how much the creatures of Greywall like their blood sports, it's perhaps not entirely surprising that the largest and most impressive building of a district is the arena. There are fights in the arena every night, and it is one of the most popular entertainment venues in town. Other than feral monsters, there are two kinds of gladiators that find themselves in Greywall's arena. The first are the volunteers. They are free men and women who fight for money. To fight in the arena, you need a sponsor, and the sponsor takes a percentage of your wins. But it can be a good way to earn a fair bit of cash and fame. Although, of course, a risky one too. The other group of fighters are prisoners. Drome doesn't believe in re rehabilitation or prisons, so a fair bit of those who break the law are instead branded and sent to the arena to fight for a certain time. If you survive your matches, you get to walk away free, but of course there's no guarantee you will. One of the stranger and more popular games in the arena at the moment is Six Stones. In Six Stones, seven fighters are sent into the arena along with one or more basilisks. The fighters aren't allowed to attack the basilisks or kill their opponents, and once there's only one person left alive, they win. A fairly brutal game to say the, at the least, and not one I recommend you throw at your players should they decide to fight in the arena, since it would essentially mean killing off all but one in your party. Another notable feature of the district are the Hydra Halls. These are large barracks that house the work crews of Greywall. Each work crew performs a specific task and is always overseen by a minter overseer who acts as the whip, driving on the crew with force, and a harpy overseer who acts as the carrot, motivating the crew and singing to them during their breaks. A work crew generally works 12 hour shifts and are paid in room and board, which is a better deal than most drone creatures are used to. A work crew share one of the barracks of the Hydra Halls. The barracks themselves are identical, but each has a symbol above its main entrance so that the crews can recognize where they are stationed. Almost all of the halls are used by the work crews of the city, but a few have rooms that are available for rent by a barter for traveling monsters. The Hydra Halls are constructed around two huge grist mills. Now, grist mills are named for the meat they served, known as grist. They can be found throughout Greywall and mostly serve the monstrous residents. 
They are large dining halls that the town workers can visit to receive their free meals, and to enjoy a bit of song. Each grist meal has a harpy assigned to it to entertain and soothe the workers. There is something rather disturbing about grist mills, although it's not common knowledge, and even if it was, most of the monsters wouldn't care, although your players might if they ever learn the truth after eating at one. Grist is made from troll. Each grist mill has a stable of trolls, and flesh is slowly carved off them, making sure not to take too much at once so the trolls can quickly regenerate. Some trolls are prisoners who were bred for food, but some are actually volunteers who offered their bodies willingly to make Drome strong. Now, troll meat is toxic, but the sisters of Sorakel have come up with a way to work around the problem. They have a special blend of herbs and spices that once mixed with the meat makes it safe to eat. After that, the grist is made into stew, sausages or pie. Just because it's safe to eat doesn't mean it's tasty. Grist has a sour taste, and dwarves are especially sensitive to its particular flavor. Still, it's appreciated by the workers of Greywall. Luckily, if you're not feeling like eating a bowl of grist, there are other places you can go in Bloodstone for a meal. You can always visit the Bloody Tooth. Well, unless you're human, or really any other so-called civilized race. It's a rough place where the patrons tend to let off steam by battling in a challenge ring in the middle of the room. If you're a former soldier of one of the Five Kingdoms, you might instead prefer the Broken Sword, a kind of neutral ground frequented by veterans. No matter what side you fought on, or what atrocities you committed, you're welcome there. Fighting is strictly prohibited, forbidden by Maul, the Warforged Tavern Keep. And should someone break that rule, then the rest of the bar is expected to help deal with the troublemakers. If you're looking for some privacy instead, you can head to the Labyrinth. An inn built into the sides of a quarry, the Labyrinth is true to its name, and operated by a family of minotaurs who take the security and privacy of their patrons very seriously. It's a good place to lie low and hide. It's also rather expensive, considering the bare-bones accommodations. But it's the kind of place you can go to to get lost, not the kind of place you expect to get a mint on your pillow. Then there's the Venomous Voice, one of the draws for tourists to Greywall. It's a tavern run by harpies that also serves as a school of sorts where young harpies come to train and perfect their arts. It's a great place to visit to take in some truly exceptional and perhaps mind-altering music. Bloodstone also offers some chances for trade. If you're wounded, you can search out the House of Worms. Worms, the shifter who runs the place, uses blood brood worms to treat the wounds, which is icky but effective. He doesn't know any spells, but he's always on the lookout for healing scrolls or potions, and if you're lucky, he might just have some in stock when you need his services. There's also Jabra, a night hag alchemist of great skill who is related to the rulers of Drome, the daughters of Sorakel. Jabra deals in all kinds of potions and alchemy, including blood gin but also trades in dreams and nightmares. She can offer some truly unique wares, but can be hard to find. Her shop is a tent, and she moves, uh, moves it around the district and can disappear for weeks at a time, perhaps to find rare ingredients or to hunt for new dreams. Then you have a skin factory. It's not a single place, but rather uh, the name of an area within the district, a sort of sub-district. The skin factory is where you will find all the city's slaughterhouses, tanners, butchers and lever workers. Basically anyone who works with meats or hides. One of the shops there, Oryx Hides, sometimes offers up magical armors for sale, made by the aging orc patriarch of the family, Gek. Another sub-district, or area of Bloodstone, is the Streets of Shadows. The streets, uh, street is dedicated to temples and shrines, and it's where the majority of the city's religious services are provided. As you can imagine, with a population as diverse as Grey Walls, there are countless different religions worshipped within the city. The most commonly worshipped gods are the Dark Six, and especially the Shadow. The priests of the Shadow teach that he is that it was he who created the monstrous races and gifted them with powers far beyond those of the races created by more jealous gods. There is a temple dedicated to the Shadow at the end of the street, known as the Eye of the Shadow. It's a small windowless black stone building. One would perhaps expect the main temple of the Shadow to be larger, but there are many other small shrines dedicated to the god found throughout the city. The Medusa priestess, Saresha, leads the temple, and she is the second most powerful and influential person within Greywall. For now, she is loyal to the daughters of Sorakel and Drome, although that may change if she ever feels that they turn away from the teachings of the Shadow. The third district of Greywall is known as Sar Kuraf, or Little Greywall in common. Most of Greywall is designed to accommodate larger creatures, but not Little Greywall. It is instead home to a large population of goblins and kobolds, and everything there is built to accommodate small creatures. 
A small folk of Little Grey Wall are an independent and proud lot, and although they sometimes fight amongst themselves, they almost always unite against a larger foe who causes problems in the district. Goblins and kobolds may be at the bottom of a food chain from Drome, but Little Grey Wall is their home, and they won't stand for the same abuse there as they do in most of their normal life throughout the city. For the most part, there is very little that would interest outsiders in Little Grey Wall, though there is a single gristmill that serves the locals. But most kobolds and goblins live, sleep, and eat in clan warrens, large housing complexes dedicated to an extended family and marked with their symbol. There are two things that might interest a traveler, however. The first is the inn, Black Bahiris. Bahiri is a master chef and is skilled in both drome and talenton, that is halfling, cooking. He serves some of the best food, food outside of the Twilight Palace, although you might not find the accommodations very comfortable, unless you're a small-sized creature. Black Bahiris is also rumored to be a meeting place and outpost for both Dargon and Solargo and uh, intelligence operatives. Wherever this is true or not, it's one of the best places to go to the city if you're seeking information, as Bahiri often picks up on rumors about what's happening around town. The other thing that might draw an outsider into Little Grey Wall is the goblin merchant known as Swift. He has no official store and is hard to track down, though asking around Black Bahiris is a good start. Swift deals in poisons, and he is most likely the best poison dealer in Corvair, able to get hands on some of the deadliest and rarest toxins known, although there is no ever a guarantee to what he has in stock at any one time. Outsiders are best to be on their best behavior while visiting the district, or they might just catch the eye of a redcaps. Named after the fake creatures of legend, the redcaps are part street gang, part vigilantes, who seek vengeance on any who have oppressed the smaller races in the past. They especially hate ogres and trolls, but will not hesitate to turn on outsiders who try to use violence and intimidation to get their way in Little Greywall. The last district of Greywall is the Karda, or the Throne. This is where Zorgilic, the Mind Flayer, makes his home. The governor of Greywall, Zorgilic, was found trapped underneath a city by the Sisters of Zorakel and was put in charge of building Greywall by them shortly after he was freed. Zorgilic is a master manipulator and the architect and designer of Greywall. The town has been laid out according to his grand design, and this has led to the rather disturbing effect that parts of a city seem to have a psychic resonance to them that influences the minds and emotions of those who dwell in the city. Alleys seem to bend in around those who walk them, radiating a slight sense of claustrophobia and fear, while marketplaces and other areas meant for, public, for the public seem to have a calming and reassuring effect on the subconscious minds of those who visit them. These subconscious signals, brought on by the Mind Flayer's architecture, help steer the flow of a city and control the population. Zorgilic is rarely seen, however, most of the time he stays within his keep, a bizarrely rounded and iridescent tower, not entirely unlike a huge spiraling conch or shell. It is said that he sits on his throne and listens to the thoughts of the city, and very little escapes his notice. The keep in the district is guarded by the Flayer Guard, an elite force of monsters that contain a unit of war trolls and a contingent of goblin were the guard is completely loyal to their Mind Flayer Master, and would be a dangerous threat to anyone who seeks to harm Zorgilic. Zorgilic does not rule the city by himself, however. Although, ultimately, his word is law within Greywall, he leaves the day-to-day -day management of the legal system to the last tower, Greywall's courthouse. There aren't any written laws in the city per se, but any citizen is allowed to bring grievances in front of a magistrate, who are all Medusa. Should the magistrate find the case was frivolous, they will turn their gaze towards the plaintiff. So most citizens don't really bring their problems to the magistrates that often, although many like the idea that they can bring pro their problems to the court. Those who are judged by the Medusa and turned to stone are taken outside and displayed around the courthouse as a warning to others. Usually, one arm is severed from a statue before it's placed outside, to make sure that even if a person is somehow freed from their fate, they will at least be maimed for the rest of their lives. So, that's Greywall, perhaps the most interesting city in Eberron. My players only briefly visited the place in my own Eberron campaign, but it's definitely a place I can see a lot of potential in for great adventures. I hope you enjoyed this little look into the city of Greywall, and if you did, why not leave a like? And comment below if you have ever run a game set in Greywall. I would love to hear your stories. If you want to support the channel, then please share this video with your friends or on social media. It really helps out a lot. You can also check out my DMs Guild page, or follow me on Tumblr or Twitter. Links to those in the description below. Until next time, Dungeon Delvers.